It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. And good morning, everybody. I'm um, kind of faking people out there probably at the beginning of the show because uh, I'm moving the countdown up uh, a little bit. We're trying to get into this faster. And part of that reason is uh, the used tubes. Um, used tubes? The Or you, used used tubes. You, the you, you hoo tubes? The you, right. I like that. The, or the hoo-hoo tubes. Um, what? It doesn't sound good. And um, um, so uh, what we discovered, um, Peggy and I discovered, I used to trim off the be- the countdown, as you know, if you if you watch us on the live stream, uh, and a lot of, lot of uh, shows that go live do this. Yes, trim, 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 baby. Burp, 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 burp. Uh, but not my finger, okay? Thank you. Oh, it's no, 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 try, try, everybody knows I, I tried, that. tried to cut the tip of my finger off with a pruning, pruning shears the other week. Um, but, uh, everybody, uh, a lot of live streams, uh, have a countdown. So, you know, they're about to start. And what I had been doing is cutting those off of YouTube and what I did not realize until a couple of weeks ago. And I saw a couple of, uh, uh YouTube videos about this is that when you trim anything off the YouTube video it eliminates the chat all of the chat and i want people to see the chat because peggy's always putting up great links there and people have terrific comments um and um so now i thought okay well here's how i do it i just really trim down the countdown and people know when we're on we're at 9 a.m central and right now i think we went on the air about 10 seconds after the top of the hour uh so folks now know that they'll get used to it. We'll train them. Uh, but I figure there a lot of them are just turning it on. Have your coffee ready. And and just nine o'clock is nine o'clock. Nine o'clock is nine o'clock. Yeah. So no more slop time, folks. <laughs> we, <laughs> we're 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 just going live as quickly as we can. And uh, it's a beautiful. Ernest di- out in Portland. Seven o'clock is seven o'clock. Be there. That's that, that's right. And we'll probably see Ernest uh, in Portland. He can give us a report on how things are are going out there. We'll be talking to meteorologist Rick DeMaio, of course, later in the show um, uh, about all the crazy weather, um, fires sending smoke across the country it's um wow it, you know and and the big discussion is how much how much of this is climate change uh, uh more and more folks more and more articles are using that phrase when they discuss what's going on with the weather um and uh and rick um he debates that still you know i i, I know that it's he's yeah, it depends. It depends on what the event is, and and Rick will uh, will uh, um, uh, will take on anybody. As we know, he's written to the New York Times. He's written to CNN. They got to put him on CNN. All right, to to debate weather stuff. That would be really fun. Uh, on today's show, we've got a lot going on. We're going to get to it in just a sec. Um, we're going to start talking local food in uh, in Illinois. Uh, because believe it or not, it was a really good spring for a lot of people who are fighting for local food uh, action. 
and uh, we're going to talk about what happened in the General Assembly. We're going to talk about what's going on with farmers markets. Um, we've got Molly Gleason from the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. We've got Be- Bob Benenson from uh, uh, Local Food Forum. Uh, and then uh, after 10 a.m., uh, speaking of climate change, we are going to be talking to uh, a couple of folks from the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. Uh, one of them is an old friend of the show. Not that she's old, just she's a friend of the show for a long it time. Hasn't been on for three years. Yeah. 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 It's it has been a while, um, and that is Edith Macra. Um, and with her, we're very happy to say, is uh, Kevin Burns, who's the mayor of Geneva, Illinois. And they're going to talk about the rollout of the Climate Action Plan for the Chicago region, where they grab all these municipalities, I say, herding, herding gatas, little legatas all over the place, and bringing them together to... That would be herding cats if people don't know who Legata is. Yeah, yeah that's right. I suppose uh, I should... Well, if anybody's watched the show, I suppose there are new people here, but that's... Oops, sorry. And that woke up Legata. She uh, she was at my feet here. I should be doing Legata cam. Can you pick cam. her up? What? Can you pick her up? Okay. Can you pick her up? Hold on. Come on, Legata. Hang on. Legata. Legata's going to make her appearance in a second here. Just hang in there, folks. Mike's herding cat. She does not want to be here. Hey, Legata. There's there's all your fans. Look at all your fans out there. They love you. You're a star. <laughs> the world's most pliable cat is, is, is right here. All right. And you know what's going to happen now. The second I put her down, she is going to run upstairs and say, yep, I don't want any more of this. Okay. I'm out of here, she says. Goodbye. So I didn't even have to use Legata Cam. I did Legata in there person. Um, at any rate, so we'll be talking about the uh, climate action plan for the Chicago region, getting all mu- those municipalities together and what that entails. How hard is that? Uh, and what are their plans for the next several decades in, in terms of addressing climate change? So with that said, we should go and uh, visit our friends who are on the screen uh, right now, and let me get your your mics on as well, because we can't talk to you unless uh, your microphones are on. And uh, on the left is Molly Gleason. She's the communications director for the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. Uh, good morning, Molly. Good morning. Happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here too, uh, especially since we're talking good food. We're talking local food, and it's good news as well. And as you know, you've worked a long time. Uh, for uh, these initiatives, and the news is not always good, especially coming out of sessions of the Illinois General Assembly. Um, and for, well, for instance, this year, the uh, the clean energy uh, bill did not pass, and it's still being held. Uh, who knows whether something will happen? We really don't know. It's that it was probably the most important bill of the session. Um, and it's being held up by coal-fired plants, by what do we do with natural gas sources, um, mm-hmm. on and on and on. And and there has to be some kind of consensus here. And will it happen? Nobody knows. Nobody. Uh, nuclear uh, is part uh, part of the issue. Uh, you know, is are we being held hostage to uh, to uh, the nuclear forces here? So um, that, but and big business. And yeah, and uh, on the other hand. The good food provisions uh, and measures and acts um, went through rather well, and we'll get to that in a second, but I also want to introduce Bob Benenson uh, on your right there, uh, who is the uh, publisher, creator of Local Food Forum, um, and uh, as I mentioned in our little tease video we did the, uh, the other day, he publishes it every day. Um, we're going to have him checked out to make sure that he's really okay. That 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 uh, that he wants <laughs> that you really want to continue doing that. Pe- Peggy publishes something once a month. I do this show once a week. It nearly kills me, um, and I don't know about. I can't speak for Peggy, but uh, what? I, yeah, what? I was going to give you a chance to jump in <laughs> there. Um, uh, but Bob, hey, hey, August is at the printer, so I'm uh, right now. I'm like, huh? What? <laughs> okay, great. There you go. Congratulations. So uh, how Bob, you doing this? every single day, sometimes twice in a day, he's writing. Yeah, absolutely. So how you uh, doing? Yeah, that's, 
that's very rare. Don't scare people. I, you know, I don't <laughs> want people to think that their mailbox will be completely full of local food for and stuff. But yeah, you know, I, I uh, have a long career where I'm kind of used to a really fast hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went independent and built my own. Well, yeah, tell us about that, uh, that uh, background of yours uh, as we uh, ramp up here. Yeah, well, um, I came to Chicago 10 years ago with my wife, who grew up on a farm in Piatone, which is a little bit south of Chicago. And um, uh, my previous career as a journalist was covering politics in Washington, D.C. But I have been, I've had a passion for food my whole life. And um, also was a committed um, consumer in the good food movement from way back to the 1980s or so. Um, avid home cook and uh, you know so I shopped farmers markets I shopped Whole Foods uh, markets before it was cool and then when I got out here I was looking for something to do that didn't involve politics or you know wasn't centrally uh, about politics and so um, I uh, was able to connect with the folks at uh, Family Farmed which is a nonprofit that uh, promotes the uh, the rise of a better food system and uh, worked for them from uh, informally for a couple of years and then for, uh, formally for seven years. Left in March to start Local Food Forum. And uh, so um, we're covering the entire range of the uh, local food system. So it's not just about farmers or just about farmers markets, about farmers, farmers markets, people who are trying to improve food access, use food as an economic development tool, early stage uh, entrepreneurs who uh, are value driven. Uh, food educators, you know, the whole range. Yeah. Um, and you and I and Peggy have all worked together. We worked together when you were at uh, Family Farmed. Uh, we, we would go to the Good Food Expo and, um, and set up shop and do a bunch of interviews. And uh, you were always very, very helpful with that. So uh, Bob's written a couple articles for Natural Awakenings. Good. Yes, He's I have. Uh, good for you. You're all over the yeah. place. We're, 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 all, we're old friends here. Yeah. <laughs> And, 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 and your live stream, back, back before live streams were cool, uh, from the uh, Good Food Expo was, uh, was always a huge highlight. Uh, yeah, uh, we, 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 we have a tendency to do everything live on this show, and I don't know if that's a good idea anymore, but uh, we do, and, and we love uh, the people who follow us live. So let's go to Molly. Uh, Molly, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about your background with the Illinois Stewardship Alliance? Yeah, so just a little bit about Illinois Stewardship Alliance. We're a statewide nonprofit organization, and we bring farmers and eaters together to solve problems in the food system. And a lot of times the solving those problems looks like uh, shifting policy. So we work really hard to communicate with farmers across Illinois to bring them together to talk about their issues and then come up with some solutions. And then they, the farmers themselves actually, you know, prioritize what policy they want to put forward and help build the policy campaigns. And then we work with eaters to understand those issues and take action on them um, because we know we just there's not enough farmers. If you want to build the power we need to change policy, we have to rely on eaters and farmers working together um, to really make those changes. So that's kind of the gist of what our organization does. And um, I've been with the Alliance for eight years. I grew up on a farm in central Illinois and uh, I kind of just fell into this work, but I've loved it ever since. And I really, um, I really see the value of shifting policy to be able to create a, a more just food system. It's one of the best ways I think that people can take action and get involved. And I really love helping people take action and get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you a question about about that and farmers. When you say when you talk about farmers, are you talking about farms of all sizes, or are you mainly focused on the smaller to mid-sized farms? Yeah, so we kind of work with two different groups of farmers. We have we have two different caucuses is what we call them. And so they're kind of our, our counselors. Um, so the one caucus is called the Soil Health Caucus. It's made up mostly of uh, larger row crop commodity farmers who really care about conservation and, and want to see more conservation practices on the land. They want to build soil health. They want to keep waterways clean. And so that's kind of one group of uh, farmers. And every policy that they put forward is around 
helping farmers earn a living responsibly stewarding the land. So making sure that the farmers that are doing those things that we want to see that are taking care of our natural resources are also able to make a living doing that because we know that those practices, uh, you know, they cost more, they are um, more labor intensive. So we want to help those farmers put those conservation practices on the land and earn their living um, doing that. And then the other group of farmers that we work with is um, called our local food farmers. This is the group that I work mostly with. It is a group of smaller, uh, diversified fruit, vegetable, livestock farmers. And the policy that they put forward is around helping Illinois farmers feed Illinois. So here in Illinois, 95% of the food that we eat is imported from out of state or out of country. It's not grown here. Um, and so, But we have some of the richest farmland in the world. We could be feeding ourselves and you know keeping that economic wealth and building the resiliency of Illinois. But um, we can't do that unless we support uh, Illinois farmers here and you know help them, those small farmers, make a living and make sure that uh, folks like uh, Bob are doing really great work helping people connect um, to those farmers and support those farmers. You know, that number, 95% um, of food coming into the state is, uh, or right, that, that, that folks eat in uh, Illinois comes from out of state. That number has been floating around a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, and, and the other thing is, uh, and I learned this a couple of decades ago, that the food that uh, we put on our table that farmers grow like, I don't know, carrots and lettuce and tomatoes, at one time, those were called specialty crops. I love that idea, specialty yeah. crops. It's like, wait a second, yeah, that's not, are. <laughs> are they still called that? That's, yep. that's nuts, and, okay? And because I, I've got a, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Got a question on that number. So that also includes like all food for schools and institutions as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right that that number has been floating around that first came out in, from a report done in 2011, I believe. The state did a report um, with the goal that at that time they were hoping that they could increase that number and so that we would do more local sourcing in the state and, you know, we would see more institutions and schools and veterans homes and prisons start doing more local sourcing. But then there wasn't really a plan to increase that number. But excitingly, this past legislative season, um, a, a new policy, a resolution passed that will create a t state task force that will start exploring how the state can start shifting their procurement policy to do more local, fair, healthy, humane sourcing um, in Illinois and from Illinois farms and businesses. So that was one of the big policy wins from this past year. We're really, really excited because once that state task force, once they get together, they're kind of, you know, assess the lay of the land, assess procurement policy, and then hopefully make some recommendations at the end of the year for actual legislation that we can put forward next year that will start shifting that procurement policy. Mm -hmm. So it's not just based on the lowest price bid. It's not going to be all of these out of state um, food corporations winning these big contracts, um, but we can start actually sourcing from uh, more businesses here in Illinois. So we're pretty excited about that. Yeah, you should be. That was one of the big wins. Uh, you uh, on your website list a lot of the different uh, acts that went through, some of the acts didn't go through, but you still got additional funding. Was was that a surprise to you when some of the bills you were trying to get passed didn't pass, but the uh, General Assembly said, anyway, let's uh, let's 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 throw a few more million dollars uh, this way for for some uh, great uh, causes like um, conservation programs. You um, the Partners for Conservation Fund was extended and received an extra six million dollars, including four million dollars for soil water conservation districts uh, to continue programming and grant work. I mean, that's that's a big win, isn't it? Yeah, that was huge. And we were like down to the wire. We were not sure how that one was going to shake out. But we had a lot of farmers working really hard to talk to their legislators and say, hey, this is really important. And thankfully, those legislators listened. And so, um, yeah, there was an extra six million put into conservation funding uh, for many different conservation programs like the soil and water conservation districts, which were kind of the boots on the ground that help farmers, um, you know, mm -hmm. with technical assistance for putting conservation practice 
practices on their land. The other thing that um, that funding will go to is uh, a cover crop rewards program for yeah. so for the folks that yeah for the folks that might not know what a cover crop is. It's something you put on your it's a it's, it's a crop that you grow after your corn and soybeans, and the idea is that you want to keep your land covered in a crop all of the time, all year round, because those roots are so good for the soil. They help build organic matter. They keep things from washing away. We don't want the soil and we don't want nutrients washing away into the rivers. So those cover crops are really important, but they're expensive and they're labor intensive and it takes time for farmers to, you know, put this crop on. And so uh, one of the things that this funding will do is help provide a reward a reward program. So for every acre that they plant in cover crops, they would get a $5 um, kind of rebate to help cover the cost of that, uh, you know, that conservation practice. And we know that farmers really love this program. It's been going on for a couple years and the funding always runs out for it. So now there'll be increased funding and we will see even more cover crops on more acres across Illinois. Although I have to say $5 per acre doesn't sound like a lot of money, but uh, you know, it, it's it, definitely it's not enough. Um, but it is, it, you know, we have to start somewhere, and so we're we're pretty happy with the good start there. Uh, but uh, getting back to co- to cover crops and the idea of cover crops, um, it's uh, as you mentioned, it's about the soil, it's about the health of the soil, and when we talk about health of the soil, we're talking about biology, uh, mm-hmm. and as Peggy knows, the motto of our show, one of our mottos is. It's the biology, stupid. Um, this, you know, instead of stripping everything bare uh, and then slamming chemicals and fertilizer down and growing, propping up the uh, the crops with fertilizer, now this helps keep the nutrients in the soil. That, as you said, they don't wash away. Um, keeps the top soil in place. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Illinois is one of the leading contributors to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And that, all, you know, a lot of that comes from uh, nutrients and soil washing away from Illinois farmland. And uh, the more we can help farmers, you know, keep that soil in place, the better we all benefit, you know, the people downstream benefit, but we mm-hmm. also benefit here in Illinois from, you know, cleaner water and uh, healthier soils as well. And I'm glad you bring up the dead zone because everything is connected, as we know. Everything in the universe is connected somehow. And um, I find that out more and more every day. But if you look at the dead zone, and for the folks who don't know what the dead zone is, it is an area in the Gulf of Mexico where, as Molly said, these nutrients wash down the Mississippi River and out uh, to the delta there. And what they do is they feed algae. The, we get these massive algae blooms. When the algae die, they suck up all of the oxygen in the water um, as the, the decomposition happens. And it means nothing can live there, not fish, not uh, crustaceans, not plants. It's, it's a dead zone. That's why we call it a dead zone. And they they ebb and flow depending on the time of year. So in the winter, the dead zones get smaller. In the summer, they get better or bigger. Why? Because more nutrients are coming down the river. And folks, it's some people think that it's the pesticides going to the Gulf of Mexico. No, that's not really it. It's the nutrients. It's nitrogen. It's phosphorus. Um, it is also silt. There's a lot of nutrients in silt that gets washed out uh, into the Gulf of Mexico. And that is not the only dead zone in the world, folks. There's probably, there's about 400 across the planet. So anywhere you have a huge river that empties out into a sea or an ocean, you've got a dead zone because upstream are all those nutrients, all the stuff that folks put into their soil or onto their soil. Um, And that includes fertilizers in your backyard it's not just farmers although farmers account for most of it but you're contributing too if you're overloading your lawn with fertilizer and this is why i tell people back off back off on the fertilizer for for your lawn because this is going down the illinois river to the mississippi river to the gulf of mexico and creating a dead zone so just thought i'd throw that in there yeah. um, <laughs> um 
we have just a few more minutes, and then and then when we get back from the break, we, we've definitely got to get to um, National Farmers Market Week, which is coming up. But I want to make sure we cover all of the good news that happened Especially in spring cottage food laws. Yeah. Yeah. Well that let's, let's go there because that was basically numero uno on your list, wasn't it? Yeah. So this was our top issue for the year. Um, so cottage foods are foods that are made in a home kitchen. They're relatively safe foods like jams, jellies, baked goods, pickles. Um, and then they can be sold at a farmer's market and cottage food laws are really great for people, um, especially low-income entrepreneurs or people who want to start a food business because it lets you do it in your home kitchen. You don't have to go out and buy an expensive commercial kitchen, which might cost you tens of thousands of dollars, you know, to open a storefront. So it lets you get started. You can kind of build a customer base. You can test out your products. And then hopefully eventually you can scale up um, into a storefront if that is your, if your food business dream. But right now, under the current law, cottage food businesses were limited to just being able to sell their products at a farmer's market. And that was a huge problem for many folks because many farmers markets are seasonal not every um, community has a farmers market and many farmers wanted to sell at fairs and festivals they wanted to be able to ship their products online um, one of my favorite cottage food vendors there on the screen there is uh, Libby and Derek Irvin of Glaciers Inn Farm, and they live in southern Illinois. And I'm, I'm three hours away from them, so I, like, you know, I have to stock up every time I go to southern Illinois. But now, <laughs> under this new cottage food law, they will be able to ship their products online. And so people like me who love to support farmers and love delicious local food can now um, order online from these cottage food businesses and get it right to our door. So that was the big um, piece of the act was that it was expanding sales avenues for cottage food producers uh, it's just to be able to do all, all kinds of more direct to customer uh, types of sales. So Illinois was one of three states in the nation that actually limited sales to farmers markets. Yeah, now, I was going to mention that. Yeah. It's like, how is it that we were one of three states in the whole nation? How, how did we get to be so backward about yeah. this? Were, were we just <laughs> lagging? Were we lagging behind? Or was there some specific reason why it wasn't allowed? I, you know, I think uh, when the first cottage food bill passed uh, back in 2011, uh, it was, it was, you know, cottage food was pretty new across the nation back mm -hmm. then. It was, they were, cottage food laws were just kind of starting to get into different states. And they, I think they just were like, let's limit this to farmer's markets because we're not sure how, how safe it is or we're not, you know, there was a lot of pushback from the public health community about like, like let's make sure this state is safe. And then now it's been going for a long time, you know, 10 years now, there's yeah. never been any food related um, mm -hmm. illness related to cottage food in Illinois or nationwide. Yeah. So um, we know that they are safe, maybe even it's an argument to be yeah. made that they are safer than some some foods that you might buy from the grocery store. So yeah. um, I know Lisa, yeah, it was Lisa Kiverest, <laughs> yeah, up in Wisconsin, Lisa Kiverest had a similar challenge for years trying to get the cottage food laws through Wisconsin. So that just changed in the last couple of years. Yeah, and yeah, Bob, and I was just going to say, Bob, you worked with Family Farm. You probably saw this a lot in, in the time you were there. Are you? Uh, I'm sorry. Did no, you? I, I, uh, I was trying to find my mute button. Oh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's, sorry, it's okay. Uh, yeah, we did. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, it really was a, a signal victory this year for, for ISA in, in getting this passed because. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, most of the concerns that were raised about cottage food laws had to do with food safety. And mm -hmm. this is a state that uh, really kind of heavily regulates the food and the restaurant industries. Um, but uh, as, as Molly says, there, there have been no incidents of uh, widespread or, or any, for, as far as I know, outbreaks of food-related illness. Um, from uh, cottage food, and it really does provide an avenue. You know, the food as the tool for economic development and economic growth is a big part of my value system, and um, and what we're trying to get across in the in local food forum, and uh, for independent uh, people, especially as Molly says, people who without the means to, you know, get, uh, create an entrepreneurial business and a startup with, a, with a, a, a lot of equipment gives them an opportunity to get their food business off the ground, which could lead to something 
much bigger. A lot of this is, uh, you know, culturally appropriate food too. So if you're Latino and you're making uh, Latino, um, uh, then you've got a market right there that's under pretty much underserved in the general uh, food market. So, um, you know, value added is really one of the next big steps for local farmers. Uh, some do it, some do it very well, some do it prolifically. But for a lot of others, it's another avenue for using their crops, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, relying almost entirely on direct fresh food sales is risky because, you know, if you're selling through farmer's markets mainly, they're wonderful. I love farmer's markets. I go to multiple ones a week. But what happens if you have a really lousy rainy day in the middle yeah. of the growing season? Then you're taking or if all that the farmer's market shut down food. because of a pandemic. <laughs> or farmer's yeah. market shut down during a pandemic. Well, you know, <laughs> we've had this discussion before. It was really kind of amazing how quickly a lot of the uh, the farmers and the farmers markets pivoted to e-commerce, and that's having ongoing uh, implications as yeah. well because you know farmers now recognize that they can have a 24/7, 365 uh, uh, consumer market. And they're going to adjust accordingly. I think we're going to see a lot more season extension and a lot more processing of local food. So, um, you know, uh, and freezing it. All right. Uh, we need to take a break here. Uh, we've just started talking about farmers markets and we still have more successes from the, uh, the General Assembly session in spring. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking to Molly Gleason and Bob Benenson. We will be right back. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard. Let's try this again. All right. <laughs> Let's try to, to move two. this. Take two. It goes like this. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. Oh, hi. I suppose you're wondering what an A-list celebrity like me is doing in a place like this. You must know, I'm saving the world. Oh, hi, Beth. Yep, saving the world again. <laughs> Did you know that 40% of all the food produced in the United States is thrown away? That means everything that went into that food, the pesticides, the water, the land, was all for nothing. Just look at this perfectly good food thrown in the trash. The pizza with extra Cheerios. At these goldfish and Band-Aid tacos. And just look at this perfect trash burger. This pasta dog looks delicious. You don't have to dumpster dive like Ed Begley Jr. to save the planet. Fight food waste by shopping smart and using what you buy before it gets trashed. That's way better. Ooh, arugula. Do your part and find out other world-saving tips at betterthaned.org. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Bob, I saw you smiling a little bit uh, with the uh, Ed Bagley uh, PSA there. He's a stitch, isn't he? Oh, wait. Now, is that you again or is that me? Hold on. Hold on. Let's see if I've got... Uh... Sorry about that. Yep. Nope. It's me. Okay. You're back. Here you go. Oh, boy. No, I, 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 I haven't seen that PSA before, and it's hilarious. And uh, okay, good on him. For you know being uh, 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 totally unashamed to do a commercial <laughs> in, 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 a, in a garbage can, uh, but yeah, it, it, he brings up a, a it's a very serious issue and it and it applies to the composting ad as well. You know we've just got to do a better job of um, containing food waste and repurposing uh, food waste uh, so it becomes uh, a productive item instead of just sitting in uh, in landfills. 
um, forty percent of uh, food uh, gets wasted. That's 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 ridiculous. And there's it's so a, many ways. I just gotta say yeah, it's a, it's a sin. All right, that 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 happens. Yeah. And here we are trying to pass laws to make food production better, and the and we have to pay attention to the end yeah. use of this as well. Yeah and make sure that all of that food that is grown gets to people so it can be consumed or they have access to it so it's not being landfilled before it even gets someplace or if yeah. it, at, at the very least gets composted so that it goes back into the soil rather than going to a landfill and as we know when you pile stuff in a landfill it creates methane yeah, you know, yeah, some people make the argument, well, when you're composting, you're creating carbon dioxide. Well, that's true. And carbon dioxide is a lot less potent than methane. Okay. And so I'd rather see that happen. And it has another use, which is you can use it uh, as an amendment um, uh, for, for growing things once again. So that's the big cycle there. Yeah, and, and there and there are some easy ways of doing things at home besides composting. That and, and you know, it's now got a name called upcycling, but it's basically yeah. reusing uh, the, the leftovers and the food scraps. And so I've got mm -hmm. a slow cooker in my kitchen, uh, uh, using vegetable scraps that I had in the freezer and turning it into broth. A nice broth. You yeah. know, and eventually, you know, it, 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 you, it, it there's a waste product at the end of that, but you're getting the most out of it. And you're also getting more value. Uh, for for your dollar, I mean, if you buy if you're an omnivore and you buy a chicken and you eat the chicken and there's the bones left over, well, if you're making broth out of the bones, then you're really extending your yeah. budget. They're buying and that you're getting the stuff. nutrients too. And you're getting you're the getting, nutrients as well. And, yeah, uh, like with vegetables, people peel off the skin, and that's some of the most nutritious portion of the vegetable. Oh, oh, oh not me. I, I I never peel my vegetables. I no. clean them really well, but I never no. I never peel. <laughs> but not everybody has that habit, Bob. I know. I know. No, it's true. We're trying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, let's. Uh, what I want to do is uh, wrap up on the legislative victories here with Molly because there's at least a couple more uh, that we didn't quite. Uh, no, there's three important <laughs> ones that I want to get to. It's amazing. I mean, it was such a productive session, uh, Molly, in Springfield this year. And one of the things has to do with uh, black farmers. Uh, tell us uh, about that victory. Yeah, so that was um, a bill that was a resolution that was introduced by Representative Sonia Harper, and our organization uh, was very supportive of it. But it basically directed the Illinois Department of Agriculture to do uh, to do a study on black land loss and uh, black farmers and um, just the uh, economics of uh, black farming in general because that that kind of study has never existed before and we know that there you know are so few black farmers in Illinois and nationwide and we want to be able to support them more and you know the way to do that is starting to understand um, some of these issues around why there are few so few and and, and you know, what kind of land is available to them and what kind of land access there is. And so this study that the Department of Ag is going to do is will hopefully help illuminate some of those issues so that um, legislatively we can start working on how do we address that those issues and make sure that black farmers are receiving the support that they need. Yeah, uh, there were, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm checking out um, a, uh, a story here in The, the Guardian the number of black farmers in America peaked in 1920 when there were 949,889, close to a million black farmers. Um, today, of the country's 3.4 million total farmers, only 45,508 are black. Uh, and this was figures from the U.S. Department of Agriculture released this month. Mm -hmm. uh, so there has been... In terms of uh, discrimination, there's been a lot against black farmers. It's just, you know, I, I don't have all of that information because that was I'm not prepared to go into that. But <laughs> we just we know it's a serious problem, and the fact that it's being addressed at all by the Illinois General Assembly is is a good thing. Yeah, and that is um, really, I, we have to give Sonia Harper so much credit because she has been really leading the charge. She's the um, um, 
Oh, now I'm going to forget the name of the title, but she's head of the House Ag Committee, and she's the first woman and black woman who is head of the House Agri Agriculture Committee, and she's been really pushing the, um, you know, b black agricultural issues and just like mm -hmm. local food I issues in general and sustainable issues in general. So she's been super great. We're really happy to have her there in the General Assembly, and, and she's been leading the charge on many of these issues. Well, one of the other issues that came up, and, and this was almost a, a, a bit separate from what you were doing was uh, what we call the Right to Garden Act. That, that wasn't ultimately what it, what it was called. Um, the, they called it the Vegetable Garden Protection Vegetable Act, Garden Protection. but we know yeah. it as Right to Garden because um, <laughs> Nicole Virgil it was rebranded, has, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. <laughs> it was one of those, one of those that took a couple years to get through the General Assembly, and so it was right to garden mm -hmm. um, for the last two years, and then um, it switched it to the Vegetable Garden Protection Act this year, and that was another one that uh, Sonia Harper was the lead on. Yes, and, uh, yeah, and we, uh, 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 we, we've had uh, Nicole uh, Virgil on the show many times. We followed this through for about four years, Peggy, I think, yeah, because yeah. yeah and uh, as she fought and fought and fought. And it started with uh, Nicole Virgil trying to put hoop house, a hoop house in her backyard in Elmhurst. Elmhurst said, no, you can't have it there, even though there are many similar structures in the town. Um, and uh, they, were, they were picking on her. They said, nope, we're going we're gonna to fight you. And um, she tried to get it done in uh, the uh, city. And finally she said, okay, if you're not going to let me grow food in my own backyard, I'm going to the, the uh, state legislature, and we'll, we'll pass a law. And it got passed. And and it's and it's you know I look at the city of Elmhurst and I say you've got a whole bunch of cities mad at you now because now this is state law. And so hey, but good good going, guys. Vegetable everywhere can rejoice because yeah. they know yeah. now, like now, they, you know they have a leg to stand on. They can they it is now perfectly legal to grow vegetables and to have a hoop house structure. In your backyard, so um, yeah. And Sonia that, Harper, awesome. we played a video of Sonia Harper in one of those ag meetings. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. So uh, one of the times we had, uh, 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 so uh, rather Nicole on Nicole. the show, yeah, on the show, yeah. and uh, and and that brings up uh, some of the the uh, uh, amazing help you've gotten. Uh, well, for we've got the one. Do we? There's the one more bit of the program with Snap. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, go for it, and then and then I'll uh, list some of these people. SNAP has also been increased by five hundred thousand dollars in the state of Illinois. Tell us about that. Yeah, and it's specifically for um, SNAP match programs at farmers markets. So what that enables uh, a SNAP customer to do is to come to a farmers market, swipe their EBT card for twenty dollars, and then get matched with an additional twenty dollars to be spent on fresh fruits and vegetables. So it helps SNAP customers you know, be able to shop at a farmer's market and afford fresh, healthy, local food. But it also puts more of those federal SNAP dollars into the pockets of family farmers in our state instead of a big box store that's, you know, maybe headquartered out of state. So uh, it's really great for both SNAP customers and for farmers kind of closing that link in the in the food chain. Um, and uh, yeah, so because of that additional $500,000 that's been allocated to that program, we will see farmer, more farmers markets across the state be able to offer that program to their community. Uh, and a lot of this happened because a lot of people got involved. You talked earlier about farmers going to Springfield, talking to legislators, uh, your volunteers, you know, different organizations like the Institute for Justice we had. Uh, the Institute for Justice on our program when Nicole Virgil was here, Chicago uh, Food, yeah, Chicago Food Policy Action Council, Illinois Farmers Market Association, who we mentioned earlier, Illinois Public Health Institute, Illinois Alliance to Prevent Obesity, Advocates for Urban Agriculture, The Land Connection, Angelic Organics Learning Center, Food Works, American Farmland, Trust Midwest, Prairie Rivers Network, Sierra Club, Isaac Walton League, The Nature Conservancy, the Association of Soil Water Conservation Districts, and of course, uh, at the top of the list, the Illinois Environmental Council. That's a mm -hmm. lot of people working really hard to get these laws passed. 
Yeah, absolutely. We could not pass any of these laws without the support of this broad, you know, coalition of organizations that is working together on these issues. So it is so important to have, um, you know, partners working with you and to have the public support as well. So if you are, you know, if you're familiar with any of those organizations or if you're not, go look them up, join them, donate, become a member because they are really great organizations and they are really um, helping to push forward, you know, both community issues and state issues to support the food system. You know, that's a good point. If you've ever looked at one of those organizations and said, you know, I like this organization, I really should be supporting it. Now, pick one out of the list yeah. that I did and say, okay. As that's well as the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we got to get you guys because you sort of brought in, and we need to give a shout out to Liz Moran Stelk, uh, who is your executive director. Um, it, it seems to me, and I don't know, maybe I'm just covering these things more than I used to, but it seems to me that the Illinois Stewardship Alliance in the past few years has become a really dynamic organization. Yeah, so much credit to Liz. Uh, she came to the organization with a community organizing background. And so she's really helped the staff understand, you know, what it takes to shift policy and putting relationships first and really making sure that we're centering farmers on these issues and making sure that their voices are heard. So she's helped us kind of shift the organization to a little bit more of a community organizing approach. And that has really made such a huge impact um, on the policy issues that we've been working on because it um, that kind of approach really brings in um, a lot more voices and a lot more support. Well, congrats to all of you. Um, and uh, Liz, thank you for your work. And Molly, thank you for your work. Let's get to thank Bob Benenson because we're about to get to National Farmers Market Week. Tell us what that is and, and how that's going to be celebrated, Bob. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Mike. Um, uh, Farmers Mar National Farmers Market Week has been going on for so long. It's, it's actually uh, uh, operates under a congressional um, uh, mandate authorization. authorization. Yeah, not, not even a mandate, but just an authorization. It's, a, it's an official national program. Um, this year it uh, runs from uh, August 1st, which uh, is a week from today, through August 7th. Um, the Farmers Market Coalition, which is the major national nonprofit, that represents uh, farmers markets, uh, coordinates this, but each of the individual states also does so. So here in Illinois, mm -hmm. it's the Illinois Farmers Market Association that's uh, coordinating the efforts and they provide uh, both the national and the, and the state organization, provide a toolkit for the individual markets mm -hmm. with graphics and information that they can share with um, uh, consumers about why it's important to, to, to shop at farmers markets. Um, some of the markets will be having um, uh, promotions. Uh, I'll, I'll be trying to aggregate some of those over the next week. Um, I, I was at Green City Market the other day and I heard that uh, they're doing a, a version of Supermarket Sweep at their West Loop <laughs> Market um, uh, to, uh, to, sell, to celebrate Farmer's Market. But, <laughs> you mean you know, how, for, how many beets can you gather in your arms and throw them into a basket? It sounds like it's going to be sort of like a scavenger hunt where, you know, you're supposed wow. to get something orange and, so you know, kind of eat the rainbow kind of concept. Oh, that sounds fun. It sounds yeah. like it's going to be fun. But, um, you know, for those of us who are dyed-in-the-wool farmer's market people, you know, every week is farmer's market week, you know, as I like yeah. to say. But, um, uh, you know, for folks who are not that engaged or are just used to going to the grocery store or, you know, conventional grocery store and getting the groceries, it's important to, uh, you know, try and engage them uh, at, a, at, a, at a more granular level, uh, you know, even if, if, if it's just one week a year. You know, we're in a situation right now that coming out of the pandemic, last year there was a big spike in interest in local food amongst consumers, in large part because that great American industrial food machine you know that mm -hmm. that you always knew for generations that if you were hungry you went to the supermarket and you bought food all of a sudden overnight that broke down and in really bad ways not only couldn't people go to the supermarket they had to wait two weeks to get on a, a delivery list but uh, you know uh, uh, lots of farmers because like restaurants and other uh, uh, buyers weren't um, accepting uh, food orders uh, you know, they were destroying food. I mean, yeah. you know, it shocked the conscience yeah. to see vegetables being dumped and eggs being smashed and even animals being slaughtered, you know, because they 
uh, the farmers couldn't afford to, uh, to keep them under the circumstances. So um, the, the idea of um, food access, of food insecurity struck a massive population that wasn't used to that. That's, uh, you know, uh, food insecurity was, uh, is, is, is always a problem for people of lesser means. But for everybody, we just had our access to uh, food was, uh, was uh, sharply diminished. So being able to first, you know, go to e-commerce and buy food or sign up for a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, made a huge comeback over the past year, um, uh, was, was uh, you know, provided them guarantee they were going to be food. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, those of us who are active in trying to promote local food, are trying mm -hmm. to um, just uh, take advantage of uh, that situation and make sure that, that, we, uh, that the gains we made over the last year uh, don't start to diminish, that people don't go back to their old way of uh, thinking. Now, farmers markets, I've always said, are, are kind of the accelerant or the starter drug for the good food movement because, um, you know, if you go to a farmer's market and you taste food that's been picked yesterday or the day before, or sometimes even today, and uh, driven to market, and it's at the peak of ripeness. You're tasting food as your great-grandparents ate it, but yeah. not as most of us are used to because the food travels thousands of miles. As Molly said, 95% of our food in Illinois, a farm steak, mm -hmm. you know, comes from uh, out of state or even from other countries. Um, and, and in that time, all the nutrients that are lost from the long there's time nutrients it's been picked, flavor it's been loss. Yeah. Yeah. There's nutrient loss. There's flavor loss. Um, uh, and then you go to the market and you taste it. And it's, and it is kind of an epiphany. Yeah. I don't mean to be too dramatic, yeah. but if you taste a perfectly ripe, juicy peach, instead of getting these hard balls, you know, driven up from uh, Georgia. <laughs> yeah. that although although I have to, beer. I have to say that my grandfather had a peach tree in, uh, his backyard in Detroit where I grew mm -hmm. up. And those were the most perfect rock hard peaches I ever ate in my <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't doubt that. Well, uh, Barb grew up on a, on a farm that had fruit yeah. trees too. So, well, and she talks I'm, about, I'm, you know, the summers. The what? The summers where she was, uh, you know, uh, the, yeah, get, get that perfectly ripe peach off the tree and the juices running down your arm. And, yeah. and that's the experience you can have when you go to a farmer's market. Well, and I'm going to bring up the show and tell that I had before the show. Ah. First apple of the season. You can't go to the store and find summer apples. You've got to be going to the farmer's markets, totally. being part of a, a CSA, a fruit CSA. And it's totally. without going to the, the, the market is such an educational experience of what's actually out there. It is totally. And, and, you know, you're learning all the time. I mean, I was uh, uh, talking to you uh, uh, before we went on the air about something called a passport melon that I've been getting from mm -hmm. Nichols Farm and Orchard here in Illinois. And you pick it up and it looks like a cantaloupe. Well, if nobody warns you that inside <laughs> it looks and tastes like a honeydew melon, you're going to be really surprised when you cut into that. Yeah, you are. Why is that hard? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, Right now, uh, yesterday, I broke the news that uh, the field tomatoes are starting to come in, which mm -hmm. is obviously, oh, yeah. the, if, if you only go to farmer's markets for one thing, that's probably the thing you go for. You go in August for field tomatoes because there's nothing like it. Well, you um, also, China. yeah, but I also want to uh, put up here something, Bob, that you did. Uh, you don't know I was going to show this, but it's um when you go to farmer's market it's also a visual delight when you see the yeah. colors and the textures it and the totally aromas is smelling it yeah. all as you walk past it yeah absolutely and i mean as as a photographer you know i i, I, I took these photos i you know i call these uh you know uh, my still lives and uh and yeah it is absolutely gorgeous this time of year um you know we always talk about eating the rainbow well, there's your rainbow. It's right there in that picture. And, and in this um, picture. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I kind of like the just the juxtaposition of the uh, the beautiful fresh uh, produce with the uh, bus stop and the street scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's a quintessential uh, farmer's market experience. But, yeah, it really <laughs> is. You, you, you go around and it's visually pleasing. It smells great. You know you're going to get beautiful food that's picked at the peak of ripeness. That's uh, got a, it's full 
um, a deck of nutrients. And, uh, and also, you know, for most things, I mean, especially for, for items I keep, such as uh, onions and, uh, and, that, uh, and those brassicas, the cauliflower and the broccoli mm -hmm. you were just showing, um, shelf life is an issue. You know, if your food, if the food that you buy um, has already traveled thousands of miles and sat in a warehouse, its, it's clock has already been ticking. And so mm -hmm. if you go to the farmer's market and buy something that's just been picked the other day, you know, I'm not saying leave it sit around for two months, use it, uh, you know, because you don't want to lose it. But it does it does keep a little bit better. Yeah. A week uh, later in the refrigerator, uh, it's going to look better than what you just bought at the grocery store. Yes, it, 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 it absolutely will. I mean, the, those colors are so it, 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 it's 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 just delightful. And, and you know, it, it, there's there's atmosphere and it's different mm -hmm. at every market. Some of them are very, you know, community neighbor markets. Yeah, you can get live music at a lot of the markets. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some of the markets will be back with uh, sampling soon for tasting things. Yeah, I think that sampling is is actually back at uh, at, at at the Chicago markets, uh, which is which is great. I mean, it's uh, yesterday was uh, at the nickel stand, and they had uh, you were talking about summer apples. Well, most of them are are, are pretty tart, but they had a, a variety of apple I hadn't tried before called pristine, which is kind of a yellow greenish apple, and it's as sweet as any full apple you can you you can imagine. So there again, it's a learning experience, and sampling helps a ton. Because yeah. if you're not familiar with the product, they'll, they, 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 you know, or you want to figure out which um, uh, stand at the market has the best field tomatoes, then you know most uh, most of the vendors are, are very generous in allowing you yeah. to, to have a taste. I think another real quick portion of the learning experience is also as you get to know the farmer, you get to learn what's in season. That if if you know watermelon aren't in season in June in Illinois. For example, no, I, you know, yeah, absolutely, that and that's what I'm trying. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do with local food forum. Is is you know, and that's why I, I you know, it it it, it it's kind of uh, as like the wired service of local food, and so I'm mm -hmm. breaking news all the time about something that's new in season. But uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, the seasons vary depending on the weather and your location. I mean, this has been a crazy year where farms in central Illinois. Had you know, the one farm I know of uh, that their entire crop washed out by those trucks. Right, right. And yet a uh, hundred or so miles away to the north, 100, 150 miles to the north at northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, they're still in a drought. I mean, you, it's hard to imagine after you've you know, been hosed like so much of the Chicago metropolitan area uh, was for a while there. That there are people who are, you know, have to irrigate. You know, and and which is expensive to grow their crops, but that's that's the way it goes. So crops are going to come at a different times in the season. Some years have longer and shorter seasons. I mean, this year asparagus, which is usually the first uh, crop uh, in market here at the beginning of May, and usually taps out in early June. It lasted into July. We had a long strawberry season in a bad year. Uh, you know, uh, you, 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 with strawberries and apricots, fruits fruits like that. If you blink, you missed it. And that yeah. wasn't the case this year. Everything's been this going It seems to be a good long. fruit year. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is, yeah. which is fortunate. You know, we, we always, uh, you know, sit around uh, uh, praying and uh, with our fingers crossed in April that there's not going to be a hard freeze because, uh, you know, once those uh, <laughs> Well, we had blew, some very chilly uh, temperatures in, in May. It was, uh, um, I, can, I can witness my tomatoes in the backyard very slow getting going this year. Although, uh, and that part of it is I have so little sun back there i'm always trying to cheat with those but i what i want to do is get across uh let people know that they can go to local food forum at localfoodforum.substack.com um and you. of course and people can subscribe you have a free version but you you've got the you know to keep you going to, to keep doing this these reports uh folks can sign up and support your work uh, Molly Gleason, uh, folks can go to ilstewards.org and get information about the Illinois Stewardship Alliance um, and the great work you're doing. Uh, we're, we're flat out of time here, but um, it, it's, any final thoughts uh, quickly, Bob, that you want to get in about farmers markets? Um, just, just go. Just go. Experience it. 
Um, if you're if you're apt to go to farmers markets, go to more more often. Um, you know, in Chicago, go to a farmers market that's not in your neighborhood. Um, yeah. yeah, because it's a great or way a to learn about another part of the city. What's that? Go to a go to a suburban market. A lot of them or are right a suburban across market the as well. Mm -hmm. uh, like like Glencoe or or or, or Ravinia. Or Ravinia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right out outside Peggy's back door. And uh, Molly, uh, Eddie, any final words about uh, the work you've done this year? I'll just tack on to what Bob said. You know, if you love farmers markets, get on our newsletter list so you can learn how to support them. We will make it easier for you to support the farms and farmers markets across yeah. Illinois. All right. Well, congratulations to uh, to you, Molly, for the good work uh, that you and your colleagues have done this year. Uh, Bob, keep up the good work and uh, um, look for uh, reports on uh, food. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the farmers <laughs> farmers market week uh, coming up That's at the uh, local food forum, uh, and we'll talk to you real soon. Yes. Awesome! Thank you so love, much. Love, love, love for participating in the show. Look forward to being back. Uh, and you will be. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking uh, mayors and municipalities and climate change when we come back. The best thing about my job is the excitement of uh, waking up every morning just wondering what the challenges are going to be that day. So how do you like my office? We lead with safety. It's the first thing that I think about when I wake up. It's the last thing I think about when I go to bed. We've got a number of employees in the office, myself included, who've been, been around for 10, 15 plus years. So people enjoy working for the company. Uh, staff retention is a thing that we're very, very keen on. It's no secret that the world of arboriculture is a male-dominated industry, but there is a fearless group of women out there that are determined to change that, and I'm really proud to be one of those women. At my office, I feel like you could take just about anyone, put a crew together, and send them out to a job and have it be successful. And that has to do with trusting the people you work with, feeling safe around them, and knowing their strengths and weaknesses. One of the proudest moments working uh, with Barlet for me was being the first to do training in a Spanish class. Barlet is all about promoting from within. We really want to focus on our people and make sure that they're trained, make sure that they understand their role and you slowly grow through your experience and then you improve and, and move on to different roles within the company. There's always new positions, even at a base level, myself included. I started off as a climber and have worked my way through to being local manager in the office. Bartlett has been really great about recognizing any kind of roadblocks for different genders, different races, people of different nationalities, and just kind of taking a bulldozer to all of those roadblocks. Every tree needs a champion. 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 Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a soup song of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn serene. Give me all that I can take. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with uh, Peggy Malecki. And as you can see in our screen, we're welcoming in a couple more guests. Now I'm going to check to make sure this time the, the microphones are on. And yes, they are. So uh, I, must have, I, must have, I must have set that one correct, uh, unlike <laughs> what I did for Bob Benenson earlier. Um, and uh, we're here to talk about what it's like to herd cats. Um, and, uh, and, and you're smiling political at, cats. Uh, yeah, political cats. Um, and you're smiling at that Edith Macra. Edith, of course, has been a guest on our show before. I've known Edith for, 
wow, a really long time. And I was just thinking, I was warming my coffee now during the break and thinking about having you on the show and all the different things you've done. And I, and I, and I had Clarence, the uh, angel, the would-be uh, a- angel second class, come into my head uh, from It's a Wonderful Life. And, and uh, you know, I want to say, uh, eat it back. Edith Macro, you've really had a wonderful life. And uh, <laughs> because you've done so many Thank different you. things and you've worked, uh, you know, with the city, you've worked at the Morton Arboretum. Um, uh, you, I'm sure you were watching the, uh, the, uh, the commercial uh, for, for Bartlett mm-hmm. with interest because of, uh, I mean, you're married to an arborist. And so, um, uh, but you've, you've done a lot of great things for our environment. You should be very proud of yourself. Well, thank you, Mike and Peggy. I have to keep coming, keep changing directions so I can keep coming back on the show. <laughs> keep you interested. You're well, always welcome, Edith. Uh, well, we can uh, we can have you on the show anyway, even if you don't change directions, because you're always doing interesting stuff. And now the latest thing is getting a, about 125 municipalities in the Chicago region together to fight climate change, which is just mm-hmm. the right thing to do. But it's also a hard thing to do. You guys have uh, come out with this. Uh, uh, and I, and by the way, before I, I, I just leave him in the dust here, look on your right side of your screen at the bottom. And that's Kevin Burns, who is the mayor of Geneva, Illinois. And uh, Kevin, thank you so much for being on the program. I, I sat in on your rollout uh, video conference yeah. that you had the other week. Um, and uh, was real happy to, to hear how everybody wants to work together to get things done. And as you know, if you look at our world, and, and, and at the bottom of the hour, we'll be talking to our meteorologist, Rick DeMaio, about the, uh, the confluence of climate change and weather. You know, where does one right. end, where, where does the other begin? But as, a munici- as municipalities, you know that. You see this every day in the actions you have to do, whether it's uh, salting a street or getting a plow out or removing trees or uh, adding trees, uh, dealing with water issues. Um, this is stuff that is uh, foremost in your mind, and this is why the uh, Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, and, and that's the name of the group of these 125 uh, municipalities, um, has come up with the Climate Action Plan for the Chicago region 2021. And you must be doing something right, or you have good publicists, uh, because uh, Politico has taken notice, and The Hill. Um, yeah. And uh, so it's not just a local group. Um, this is something I'm sure that you want to spread far and wide, not only throughout the United States, but throughout the world. So uh, let's let let me start with you, Kevin, um, uh, okay. about that. And and those cha- what are the kinds of challenges you face as a municipality uh, when it comes to climate change? Well, first of all, good morning, Mike and Peggy. Pleasure meeting you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on on this broadcast. Um, to answer your question, Mike, I want to give you a little background. Uh, we actually surveyed the communities that participated in our Greenest Region Compact, which is a, mm-hmm. a predecessor, if you will, to the Climate Action Plan and an ongoing concern, of course. We asked our municipalities and our counties, uh, cities large and small, what are the two greatest impacts thus far regarding the change in climate? And the answer was overwhelmingly heat islands and flooding. The reality is that flooding is significant. And of course, a day like today, uh, the impact of heat on the built environment and how that heat is exacerbated because of the built environment causes a lot of concern for a lot of people. So Mm -hmm. that's the quick answer to your question. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Last week, uh, we had... um, uh, Deborah Shore, commissioner from the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, of on and and we talked about their strategies for flooding and and handling stormwater, and that's something that you have mm-hmm. to deal with. Um, in yeah, fact, sure. I I came up with an idea during the week after she was on the show, um, and it was um, my my slogan is unpave fifty percent, and uh-huh. and the idea being, and I got some people who who said we like it. Let's move forward on this. And the idea yeah, it's is like it's gotten its own momentum in the last few days already. Um, and the idea being, 
we pave too much. All yes. you know, anytime there's a shopping center, anytime there's right. there's street work, it the emphasis is on how can we make this an impermeable surface? How do we just flatten it out and and give the water a place to flow directly into the storm? And of course, it's gathering all the chemicals, it's gathering all the detergents, it's gathering all the pesticides that we throw down, and it's going into our water. And then it has it to never be never gets unpaved. Uh, right. Yep. And and those right. things don't get unpaved. And if they were unpaved, we wouldn't have these kinds of flooding problems. Uh, would, would we, Mayor? Uh, we would likely not, certainly not to the severity that we have now. But, but Mike and Peggy and, of course, Edith knows this uh, intimately. The reality is we're finally catching up to the decisions made decades ago. Um, and, you know, I come from a, a little town of Geneva, Illinois, 40 miles west of Chicago. Our race for to be like other communities with regard to economic development, shopping opportunities, dining opportunities, likely led to the, let's welcome everyone in. And of course, the principal issue is how do we park everybody? Yeah. And if we can achieve that parking through our current zoning, success, life is good. Now we're realizing that some of those decisions weren't the wisest, if you would, in terms of long-term sustainability. Uh, we need to change our zoning codes. We need to realize that we should not be building, frankly, football field size parking lots of pure asphalt mm -hmm. and what have you, simply because there's six or seven busy shopping days of the year. That's a that's a gargantuan change of attitude, of course. Mm -hmm. And I should mention that you are uh, the uh, the uh, chair of the environmental committee for the environment Metropo and energy subcommittee yeah that's correct I, I have the pleasure of uh which really translates to do what either tells you to do <laughs> <laughs> and uh and and edith of course is the the director of environmental initiatives for the environment committee right. um mm -hmm. and tell me edith a, a little bit about your role uh i, I mentioned herding cats before but how is it possible to get all these municipalities and you haven't even gotten all of the municipalities mm -hmm. in in the region together where do you start i mean do you pick up the phone and say hey do you care about climate change how, how does that happen yeah and thank you for that uh, that introduction and i'm glad kevin got to talk first because you know as kind of lead cat um it's not <laughs> it's not hard um I've been working in community assistance and local government and different levels of government for a long time. Um, and you'll often hear rumors that the one area of government that really functions well is local government. Um, and I'd like to believe that there's just this intimate link between community and the leaders, you know, if, uh, and you can tackle Kevin in the grocery store um, and other mayors, you know, they're part of the community. So the, mm -hmm. the dialogue that people have at a local level, particularly in our smaller communities. So the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Mayor's Caucus, we represent 275 communities. One of them is Chicago and the rest are not. Um, so the, you know, the average community size, it's suburban community around 20,000 people. Um, and a lot of them have a citizen commission where um, there is a direct uh, dialogue with the people who care about sustainability, climate change, the environment, trees, natural resources. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, that dialogue has resulted in a kind of readiness for climate action. And the trick really, um, Kevin mentioned our Greenest Region Compact, and to talk about that a little bit, because it really is the precursor uh, for the climate plan, that was done um, by looking at what communities are already doing um, and tallying those up and saying, you know, that's sustainability, really good work. Uh, let's let's kind of count that, recognize where it falls in terms of sustainability and the uh, tie a goal, goals around those types of actions. And the leading communities that had a sustainability plan, and there were 30 or 40 of them when um, we started the Greenest Region Compact five years ago, and we took those goals and brought them into a consensus set of goals. And that's the foundation for um, the climate action plan. So when we went to go do the climate plan, um, the trick was, uh, there, and you mentioned 125 um, uh, municipalities, it's actually 134 communities that have formally pledged to the Greenest Region Compact. Mm -hmm. So those communities already understand what sustainability is. And the whole uh, challenge with the Climate Action Plan was then to pivot and say of all of these things that are sustainable, 
which are the ones that are most likely to have um, benefits for climate action? Well, climate action is two buckets. It's climate mitigation, get rid of greenhouse mm -hmm. gases, greatly reduce them. Climate adaptation, which is what uh, Kevin was talking about, which is managing climate change that's already here. And that's flooding, heat, and um, drought is the third uh, major one. So it's really a matter of, of focusing the actions that municipalities know how to do, actions that they had already agreed to support, goals that are in common, and fine tuning it and focusing it so that it really makes a difference in terms of climate. Yeah, I uh, I don't know where I pulled some of those numbers out of my hat, um, but you have 200, let's get this straight, you have 275 uh, participating uh, municipalities in the mayor's caucus? Correct. So it's and a then, membership organization. Mm -hmm. Right. And are they all this region or are they other regions as well? It's the uh, greater Chicago metro region. Okay. So seven county metro region. All right. So 207. There, Go ahead, Peggy. I was guess, is there a reason why some of the mun municipalities may not be participating? Um, Kevin, I'll let you, I mean, we're... we're <laughs> I'll let you tackle that. I mean, part of it is okay. capacity and reach. But. Well, 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 I have to say something, and, and I appreciate it. When I was watching the uh, the rollout video or the participation mm -hmm. par participatory video that you guys had, I actually asked that question, and Edith, you picked up on it and asked one of your people. Uh, I said, you know, what do you do about uh, municipalities that are uh, reluctant? to be part of this. Okay. So uh, yeah, Kevin, perhaps you can address why some people might not be part of the compact. Um, thanks for clarifying the question. I wasn't certain if Peggy had asked about whether or not why some communities aren't part of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, but you're specifically talking about the or both. Venus region or both. Okay. Well, I think there's, there's a couple answers. I think the first most salient answer is so oftentimes the size of the community dictates what they can do with regard to resources reach based on personnel. Uh, we have communities that are, are I mean, Geneva is a small community. We're about 23, yeah. 24,000 people. We have communities less than 1,000 that are participating with us and communities that are less than 1,000 who simply don't have the human capital to do okay. more than what they're currently doing. Uh, we respect that, of course. But the reality is, even if these communities can't participate in either the mayor's caucus programming or the Greenest Region Compact slash Climate Action Plan, we know that by getting the, the majority of the communities in the Chicagoland area, all communities will benefit by our work. And we recognize that those communities that don't have the resources, the time, or even the talent in-house to accomplish certain goals, we respect that. Is we're not going to leave anybody behind. We're going to continue to demonstrate what we can do collectively and then celebrate collectively what we've achieved. And uh, perhaps they can pick up portions of it as time goes oh, on. Of course, absolutely. We, you know, if I've said this a thousand times before, the, the plan, it's important to denote what the plan is not. The climate action plan is not a fiat. It's a yeah. framework to get things done. So rest assured, communities large and small, join us and we'll help you build that framework that fits your community. Making public yeah. works decisions, making planning and budgeting decisions. Absolutely, correct. absolutely. Um, absolutely correct. Well, let me, along that line, and it's something that just popped into my head, I assume your organization has dues and being part mm -hmm. of it involves some financial commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be a barrier to some, you mentioned that not every, not every municipality has the wherewithal to, to be mm -hmm. part of this. Um, do you have right. a sliding scale by any chance? We, the Metropolitan <laughs> Mayor's Caucus does. Absolutely. We do not right. have a dues membership with respect to the Greenest Region Compact nor the, nor the Climate Plan. And to your point, Mike, I think it's important to perhaps amplify that point. In the last 17 months, we have seen a significant impact on municipal finances throughout Chicago. Yeah, definitely. And when, when pencil comes to paper, and whether it be the CFO or the chief administrative officer or even a city council says, where can we eliminate expenses? Oftentimes, membership organizations are the first to be impacted. Hmm. Maybe they'll return to the four or the fray later, but right away, if I can eliminate a $10,000 membership or a $5,000 membership, that's gone. And wow. We, we well, that, and, and unfortunately, it, it's... 
we're, we're, we're allegedly the one species that can look ahead into the future. When it comes to climate change, some of us, some of the species members have that ability and others seem to be sorely lacking in the ability to look at and you know it's like almost anything that that degrades our environment we look at the immediate cost we don't look at the cost down the road and this is something that you guys are are, are addressing or the lessons learned from right right past, from before go ahead so uh, if, if i can just make a comment on the um who's not participating i do want to just celebrate First of all, the um, Greenest Region Compact is the largest regional sustainability collaborative for municipalities in the country. One of the reasons that we got invited to participate in this regional climate planning work, we were um, mentored by the European mm -hmm. Union who came to the yeah. US and said, we'd like to demonstrate or see how uh, regional climate planning planning could work in the US context. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, four collaboratives that joined um, three that finished and we are the largest too. So while we don't have everybody on board, as Kevin said, we're incredibly inclusive. Our mm -hmm. strategies are designed to be adapted to communities of any size. Okay, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that NOAA is part yes. of this. The uh, National um, uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and Correct. they, how, how is it that you work together, Edith? Um, and so the, when we were offered the opportunity to participate in this European Union project, uh, I came to the table with expertise in more climate mitigation. Uh, so Kevin and I and the Environment Committee had worked on a lot of issues that are more related to um, clean energy. And of course, my background being natural resources, there was a lot of expertise on reducing impacts, uh, reducing climate change um, uh, through mitigation of emissions. The, I was very weak on the climate adaptation. We hadn't really talked about it in our region much. Um, and I don't know that we had a, a very strong understanding of what the municipal role was. So um, I made a, a request to NOAA, uh, who has expertise through something called the US Climate Resi uh, Resilience Toolkit. And they had just rolled this out and were looking for communities um, to pilot their program on or par uh, participate in the planning process. And I asked if they would be interested in supporting us as a region. And then the partnership developed just as uh, 2020 broke, <laughs> you know, the yeah. year that it was. Um, and so they uh, brought tremendous expertise, uh, primarily around uh, climate adaptation, but ended up bringing in a very strong team that helped us uh, with, uh, s with stakeholder engagement and then as well as the, um, the science behind the plan. Can either of you give me a, a, a concrete example of climate adaptation that you, you know, you might be employing in the near future? Go me down. Take that one. Oh, sure. Go ahead and chime in, Edith. I think I know what you might mm -hmm. address, but I'd like to chime in as well because I can give you a concrete example. No pun intended. Let's not use the word concrete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, right. All right. Um, <laughs> the bell. No, 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 no. I, 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 no, I got a better one. There we go. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> When's the last time you've gotten a rim shot on a on a call, Mayor? That's right. Honest to God. <laughs> I bet many mayors don't get rim shots on when they're yeah. talking to people. <laughs> Kevin, you've got the you've got the rim shot, so go for it. You go first. Well, it, it, you know, Edith talked about the very real and very important distinction between mitigation and adaptation. Um, adaptation is something that communities like Geneva and elsewhere are discovering actually makes a huge difference. Uh, whether that be, as we discussed earlier, uh, reducing lot sizes for parking areas, including pervious pavers, um, rededicating land and returning it to its natural habitat. For example, in the city of Geneva, uh, we actually purchased through referendum a 500 acre wetland that will forever be open space. In fact, nice. we sell and we have sold. It actually paid back the entire $10 million referendum through selling wetland credits throughout the Midwest. Um, it is the largest acquisition of property in the community's history. Uh, we also, of course, understand that um, as the built environment continues and the pressure on our built environment, how can we do things a little bit differently with respect to the impact of that built environment on our existing infrastructure? Mm -hmm. um, Here's a perfect example, Mike and, and Peggy. During the heavy storms of about, what was it, a year or so ago, the massive rain events we had, mm -hmm. on average, the city of Geneva's drinking water 
and wastewater facility pumps about 6 million gallons. That day, we pumped almost 20 million gallons. Mm. Wow. How do we adapt to those sort of massive events? We have to consider time and time again the impact of the built environment, why we're building things, where we're building things, how we're building things, and the impact on the existing infrastructure. Because no community I know of can continue to build bigger infrastructure systems just to accommodate the frequency of more storms, more runoff, what have you. We simply can't afford to. Yeah, and and when you look at not necessarily cli- well, part partly climate change, but I think of um, species loss. Um, it uh, goes hand in hand with uh, habitat yeah. loss, um, and that's why it's important that you do the uh, the adaptive uh, measures that you are in Geneva. I I I wish sometimes we would slow down. We have so many built up areas already that sure. we could reuse to better. Uh, use uh, and instead of continuing to just go out and you know it used to be that we lost uh, forests to cornfields and we said that was bad but then when you lose cornfields to strip malls that's even worse um, and, uh, and it's that the empty that's, strip malls are left and new ones are built right and that's where the uh, unpaid 50 percent comes in all right uh we don't have too much more time but i have a few things here can i add um I, yes I, I just go for a- it so one thing that I wanted to make sure that gets mentioned in terms of the adaptive actions, this is really where the equity um, issue comes in, in terms of right. who will be impacted um, by climate change. It's usually uh, poor communities of color, people without access to resources, um, st- housing that isn't up to snuff, uh, access to air conditioning. So one mm-hmm. of the concrete uh, measures that all municipalities can do is um, be in touch with, uh, identify and know who's vulnerable in your community mm-hmm. and then uh, make connections to resources. So that's one of the key measures, just to, to add that as a compliment to what Kevin said. And, and tying in the health and wellness aspects. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, right. Social so bu- just- building personal and family resilience um, mm-hmm. with access to with keeping people healthy, keeping communities healthy, and then community structures. This is something uh, local municipalities do really well. That sense of community, that sense of participation that builds community resilience and the ability to bounce forward uh, when when disaster strikes. Yeah. And social justice has to be a huge component of of anything you do. All right. uh, This is something that uh, you had in your presentation, Edith. Uh, What are we looking at here? So what this is, so if you're looking at the left on the orange, um, that is the period at which CO2 emissions are greenhouse gas emissions, because it's more than just CO2, are climbing. Uh, That uh, line in the middle, we envision this to be the the year of action. So this is 2021. But the important Mm -hmm. part of this graph is that leveling off um, that's on the blue on the right hand side of the screen. So even if we halt emissions right now, we still have to continue to adapt to climate change because the impact of those emissions will be with us for a long, long time. Emissions don't go away. They persist in the atmosphere te- uh, for um, decades or even hundreds of years. And it takes a while to turn around this giant ship uh, for us yeah. to, make those, uh, to make those changes over time. So that's what that shows is that, yeah, adaptation will be with us for a long and time. And I should mention that your goals are by 2030 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 50% from 2005 levels. By 2040, 10 years later, reduce uh, them to 65% from 2005 levels. And at 2050, greenhouse gas emissions reduced at least 80% from 2005 levels. Right. Uh, I, I, I see that, and my feeling is that at the same time, it's ambitious and at the same time not ambitious enough, given Correct. where we are. Because um, I know there are some people who would say, oh, that, that's a good goal. Well, yeah, but as you said, the, it's the Titanic here. How do we, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the doing it by 2030 will be the hardest part because my feeling is once we get on the road to that, it becomes a little bit easier, one would hope. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But- the 2030 might be the lower hanging fruit. Um, which oh, really? Is, okay. Mm-hmm, yeah. So the, they're looking at cleaning up transportation um, sector as being a very big win. Um, and then the blue, um, if you're looking, thank you for putting up my wedge graph there. <laughs> yeah. um, 
So we're tackling the big issues first. So if you look at decarbonized energy sources and decarbonized transportation, the two blues in there, that means um, stop halting the fossil fuel generation for mm -hmm. um, creating electricity and powering homes and buildings and, and um, operations, and then also transportation. So the big wins come from the technologies that are known and existing. Um, if you'll just to address Mike, the 80% target. So yeah. if viewers want to look to the bar at the bottom um, of that graph, that says needed innovation. So using the, the data that we had access to, which is imperfect, but this is the, you know, the first climate plan for the region, um, using the data that we had, the technologies that are known and models that were available, we were only able to model um, slightly more than 80% reduction by 2050. It's that innovation, better data, better modeling. It's really an all hands on deck right. to get to the, the net zero emissions. So we do have a goal of net zero, but the actual measurable target that's data driven is 80% uh, because that's what the models show. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was going to show another graph, but I, I see we're, we're really um, getting close to the end of our time here um and so i, I don't even know what the, the the i had something in my head and it's like gone so uh um let's talk uh very briefly uh, about the first steps here that uh as you engage this how how do you ease municipalities into this well, if I may, Mike, uh, I'm not certain we have to ease municipalities so much as we have to be, I think, respectfully aggressive in inviting them to join us by demonstrating that this is not just about, although it's critical, mm -hmm. climate action, this is also about economic, social, sustainability to boot. If we yes. can't gain control of our climate crisis, how can we gain advantage in our economic opportunities? Um, and I, I have to credit Kim Stone, Council Member Kim Stone from Highland Park, who, who primarily shared that in our launch event. While we talk about climate left and right, we recognize that climate, economic opportunity, sustainability, social justice, and inclusiveness is all part of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, and I look forward to, as I've said before, uh, riding the circuit with Edith and communicating to municipalities, large and small, how not only this plan can help, but how we can harness the energy, no pun intended, from their respective <laughs> communities and drive this change from the bottom up. Hey, that's two. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, you, you, would you care to try for the trifecta here? I don't know. It's been an electrifying morning. Thank you for uh, having me. But actually, you, 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 you read my mind because that's that was the question that just went out of my head. And oh, it was good, about good. the uh, the financial uh, end of it. And Kim Stone yeah. did uh, answer that question. Uh, yes. And it was my question that I asked because I said, uh, how I do you drag people into this? And she said, well, it, explain to them that they're going to save money. That's how yeah. municipalities uh, will become they, part of this. They can see hard numbers. If, if I could borrow on Kim Stone's real quickly with Highland Park switching uh, municipal vehicles to hybrid. Right. They've got exactly. hard dollars that they can see on savings. Right. That's exactly right. So uh, that's it. We're, we're, we're out of time. If you want more information, go to mayorscaucus.org and you can find more information. Or you can go to my website, go to mikenovak.net. I've got the links to the uh, report um, and, uh, and other information that you might find useful. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you both being on the show. And Edith, the last time you were uh, on our program was to... Uh, talk about the uh, uh, Greenest Region Compact. So that was the precursor mm -hmm. to this. And now yeah. I'm glad to see how this is all following yeah. up and falling into place. So yes, uh, it's falling into place. Um, good, good. Continued success. Uh, uh, Mayor Kevin Burns of Geneva, Illinois, thank you so much. Uh, Edith you. Macra from the, the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, thank you so much. And uh, keep you. us posted on, on how you're all doing. Yeah, certainly okay. will. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, what, and, and you might want to stay tuned to uh, hear what uh, our meteorologist, Rick DeMaio, says. He actually sent me a, a copy of your report. He said, have oh. you seen this? I said, yeah, I already know about it. We're talking about it oh, on good. the show this yeah. week. So, uh, But he's coming, he's coming up with weather and climate next. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki.
You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collective Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. This guy is a real jerk. He thinks the rules don't apply to him and treats all of the preserves and trails like his personal off-leash playground for his dog. How many ways can one dog owner be a jerk? This is not the way to let your dog out of the car, jerk. A leash dog only counts as a leash dog if the owner is holding the leash at all times, and not just when others are watching. What a jerk. These are picnic tables, not grooming platforms, you jerk. Hey jerk, pick up after your dog. Letting your dog wander far ahead sets up potential collisions with other trail users, jerk. Pay attention to your dog, you jerk, and use that leash in your hand. That's not what we meant. Put the leash on the dog, jerk. Hey jerk, nice job finally using a leash, but it's way too long and a disaster waiting to happen. Leashes need to be no more than 10 feet long. We love seeing dogs in the preserves, but please follow the rules to avoid being a jerk. Jerks can easily ruin the experience for everyone else, so don't be a jerk. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, Rick DeMaio, uh, restless there, getting uh, all, all set up. I noticed you just kind of, warmed up. I think, yeah. He's I, warming you're, up. He's you were doing stretching. Your, stretching and, and, yeah, you know, just how's, how's, <laughs> the, ba how's the back, Rick? Oh, 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 yeah. It's funny you mention that because um, it was doing you okay. You guys played golf this past week. Yeah. Yeah, we played golf on Thursday um, and I tweaked it. Thursday morning and then Thursday afternoon I was not in good shape. Friday I was fine. So I went for a 10 mile bike ride yesterday and went uh, swimming and I tweaked it again. So, <laughs> oh, no. um, yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. It, you know, it, it, it's, it's part of getting older, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I just went for a, a swim this morning and I went for a swim last night. Um, so How's the I'm water? Trying to, trying to Low seventies, isn't it? Um, it was a little bit cooler than that, Peg. I I know that okay. the um, I think the 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 Mid Lake buoy was seventy two, but uh, mm -hmm. Lee Street Beach because we had some southwest winds yesterday it was down to like sixty eight. Oh yeah. Um, okay. But it southwest, didn't matter because yeah. yeah, when I when I went swimming last night with the full moon, it was perfect because uh, when you have dew points in the mid seventies, a lake water temperature of sixty eight feels pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, it was kind of uh, soupy out yesterday. Yeah, oh my, it was kind real of. Humid. Yeah, and you know, at one point, um, Peg and Mike, after the rain stopped, um, the dew point jumped to 77. And it's amazing, you could definitely tell the difference between a 72 dew point and a 77. It's almost like they say you can cut the air with a knife. Yeah. Uh, it was incredibly humid. And then the, um, we want to call it the dew point front, kind of moved south of the area last night. But um, it's, I mean, the dues right now are in the upper 60s, so it's not as humid as it was yesterday. People will notice that, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, still, it's still warm and it's still humid, and uh, 
Uh, this is typically the hottest two weeks of the year. And between yesterday's 92 and today's probably low 90s and tomorrow and also Tuesday, uh, we have four straight days of temperatures in the 90s, something that we haven't done since the um, second week of June. Uh, yeah, and uh, yesterday uh, that rainstorm came through. Peggy says she didn't get very much. I got about six i got six tenths of an inch in my backyard i mean it came down in buckets for but but really fast like 20 minutes it was over and it filled up my rain barrels for which i'm grateful mm -hmm. um and then it just moved on and then the sun came out and i expected you know how when a front passes and, and you think oh it's going to be nice and cool and then i walked out and i got slammed yeah. by that dew point and i went holy smoke i'm going back inside and and right. Rick, you'll appreciate this you can do the sleepover now because um i finally uh turned on the ac for the first time yesterday at my house wow. yeah <laughs> couldn't deal with it what? it was just what, too much what, what took so long <laughs> i don't know i just first of all i i, I don't I'm not a huge fan of air conditioning. Yeah. I mean, our, our neighbor, it's yeah. six, 60 degrees out and the AC is going all day long. And I'm like, oh, that, that's nuts. Yeah. Okay. That's crazy. Yeah. But uh, I'd like to but, know, yeah. know what the real world is like out there, you know, appreciate, <laughs> you know, our, the atmosphere and the temperature and yeah. our climate and what we Have live some in. Air, fresh air coming in and yeah. But today, when it gets to, no, I, I live in an old house, and when it gets to the point that I can't get the doors opening and closing, that's when I have to turn the air on. Yeah, turn the air on. yeah. I and I and I think you're right, Mike. Is typically after a thunderstorm comes through, you know, you look. You're, you're, uh, hold on, Jack. Said Jack. Yeah, hold on a second, Jack. Jax. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Mike Novak show with Peggy Malecki and Jax the dog is, uh, where's Legata cam? I need to get my kitty back up. This is out snoozing on the front porch. So. Okay. Oh, there's there Jax. Hey, there's Jax. Jax. Hey, Jax. <laughs> Manipulate the dog. They love it. Yeah. He, he likes to let everybody know, um, who's coming up the stairs, what his name is and that this is his place. But quiet please sorry about that that's okay um, we were we were getting we oh, were somebody just about, said it's a wolf break <laughs> yeah um the rain that came through yesterday i think i sent you guys a map of the cooperative observers from this morning showed um there was about an inch and a half literally a, a trail of of inch and a half rain that followed that thunderstorm which produced winds in about 50 to 55 mile per hour range yeah. Um, I got about probably four tenths of an inch. Peg, you probably got maybe about a quarter of an inch. That's about it. Yeah, um, barely and two once tenths, again, if that. Yeah, if that. And and once again, the areas that needed it, Northern Lake and McHenry County, missed out on it. Um, so, so yeah, the good news is that they finally took that area um, out of the extreme drought. But again, yeah. you know, I, I was driving through that area on Friday and the corn looks fantastic. So again, I still think they're probably using, yeah, there you go. They're, they're still probably using, and the area that I talk about is Southern Kenosha County and then Walworth County. Those are the two most mm -hmm. Southern Southeast counties um, in yeah. Wisconsin and everything looks fine. So I, I still like feel a little like- Little Racine probably, County too, up there. Yeah, Little Racine County as well. You're right, Peg. So I still feel like they're probably using some numbers, um, maybe from Rockford and Waukegan, that don't really reflect. Also, um, that abnormality of low rainfall occurred pretty much about six months ago. But since then, there's been just in the, the, the right amount of rain and just the right amount of warm temperatures that allowed uh, much of the corn and soybean crop to grow. So again, it's all about timing. Yeah. But again, speaking of timing, when you have a thunderstorm come through between four and five o'clock in the afternoon and it didn't rain to the north. So what happened was that pocket of cool air that was over us got moved to the south or basically got kind of mixed back out in the flow because after the rain stopped, it was still 90 at Rockford and 90 at Janesville. And that air just basically moved over the ground that was wet. So now we had warm air coming over no ground that yeah, there was no breeze. 
And literally, I think at about eight or nine o'clock last night was probably the most humid it felt almost all summer. It, mm. it, it really was amazing. Um, <laughs> but the dew right now is down to 63, and it's a lot drier than it was yesterday. But again, people will say, oh, by God, it's still warm and humid, but it's not It's not anywhere no, like it was yesterday. Not even the same ballpark. Like the yeah, yeah, not even in the same ballpark. Uh, but here, this is the map you sent me that I'm really fascinated by. Um looking at the rainfall yeah. i mean we had some here but look where the heavy rainfall was it was in arizona yeah i mean um on friday phoenix had eight tenths of an inch of rain uh the, the high temperature on friday in phoenix was 83. i don't think i've ever seen 83 in july when the normal high is like 105. Hmm. so what happened was they had a pot what's that pig i'm sorry i said especially this year yeah, yeah. I mean, they've actually been in one of the better monsoons. Uh, but if you think about it, what's happened is the big dome of high pressure, which has been responsible for all the heat in California, the Pacific Northwest, and the Northern Rockies, has moved so far north that on the south end of that high, it's pulling moisture in uh, literally from the Gulf of Mexico and then pulling it over the mountains. And now you're getting this repeat every day, repeat every day of rain across that area. Now you gotta be careful, just because it says moderate rain doesn't mean that they're getting huge amounts of rain. Mm -hmm. What this map shows you is the amount of rain that they're expected to get compared to normal. So if normal rain is like 0.02 and they get 0.80, that's moderate rain. For us in Chicago, that would probably be on the slight. So again, these maps are really more reflective of what, what is climatologically normal. And again, um, that's where most of the clouds and most of the rain have been over the last two or three weeks. All the dry weather has basically been pushed to the north. So this is good news for areas to the south and west. But again, once you get into that area um, on the northern edge where some of those thunderstorms can produce lightning, that's where we end up getting you know, some of the thunderstorm-induced lightning. Now, this next map basically shows the 6 to 10-day outlook that moisture now begins to get pushed northward, which means that you're gonna get some relief from the heat. But again, if you end up with situations on the rim of that, with thunderstorms that produce lightning, this is gonna actually make the wildfire season kind of tick up a couple of notches. Mm. So what's good for one thing this time of the year is bad for the other, uh, due to the fact that the ground is still so incredibly dry. So even yeah. though you're getting a 50% chance of rain, it's really like a 90% chance of thunderstorm-induced uh, wildfires. Yeah, looking at these, uh, this is the 6 to 10 day, and then here's the uh, 8 to 14 day. Um, you would look at this map, and I guess the untrained observer would say, oh, as you just said, oh, this is great, there's relief, there's rain coming to the west, but as you also say, it might not really help. No, no. In fact, it's going to hurt because you're going to end up with these thunderstorm-induced wildfires. Now, the only thing it can do is if in some areas you are getting a wildfire and you see a couple of thunderstorms moving overhead, granted the cloud cover will decrease the amount of sunlight, meaning that you won't be as warm, and maybe some of that rain, if it does fall, will most likely help from a standpoint of suppressing the growth of the fire or suppress the fire itself. But generally speaking, this time of the year, when you're in the midst of the wildfire season, most of the people who fight fires look at this and go, uh-oh, we have some problems from a standpoint of what can it actually induce the amount of wildfires. That's like someone who doesn't like fireworks going, oh my God, they just brought in a truckload of fireworks even though they're for free. <laughs> Someone's <laughs> gonna shoot them off and look for fireworks. And uh, here is the, uh, the temperatures in the next six to 10 days. Uh, you can yeah. see that the southern part is a little bit cooler than the north. Yeah, and, and that's the area that we were just talking about where that, <coughs> excuse me, that monsoonal moisture and cloud cover has kind of suppressed temperatures. But again, look at, look at where the, um, the warm weather is pushing back up north, Oregon, Washington, um, yeah. up into the Dakotas. As a matter of fact, high temperatures this week in Bismarck are expected to exceed 100 degrees for four straight days on the eastern edge is where we are so we'll actually have a front come through us late wednesday and being that this map 
literally begins from July 30th to August 3rd. That's pretty much the middle of the week. So we're going to actually cool off somewhat Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And as you can see, as you go all the way into the first week of August, we're actually staying somewhat uh, below normal. So again, the heat continues out west and the cooler weather uh, begins to push in across the Northeast and the Great Lakes. And you know what? You know, Peg and I have been talking quite a bit about lake water temperature. Lake Michigan last year at this time was almost 75. The mm -hmm. lake is running around three degrees cooler than it was last year, but that's the southern buoy. The northern buoy is only at 67, and Lake Superior is basically about 57 to 62. So every time that you notice, guys, that we've had a cool front come through, it's been a little bit cooler than normal due to the fact that Lake Superior has actually helped to modify that air mass um, as it moves south. So we always get modified from not just Lake Michigan, but Lake Superior as well. And the fact that the northern lake, uh, Lake Superior, is about 8 to 10 degrees cooler than it was last year is one of the reasons why we've had, I think, 15 days so far this month of below average uh, temperatures, which is really quite remarkable considering where we were in the month of June when we had the fourth warmest month on record, June speaking. Yeah. Uh, we've got some comments that have come in, uh, kind of interesting stuff here. Um, let's see. Uh, Dan Costa said he had 1.2 inches. He's in um, Westchester. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and uh, Linda Dowd uh, says uh, right now her dew point in Ravenswood is only 52, she says. Um, um, yeah, that may be a... I don't know what she's using to measure that because I, I, I last checked O'Hare and they were 63. So okay. nonetheless, 52 is 63. It's a lot lower than it was yesterday. And but again, I, when you look I, at that, yeah, when, when you look at that map I sent you this morning of the local rainfall, you can literally see how the rainfall followed the track of the thunderstorm. So oftentimes when people on TV show you um, like the forecast models of rainfall, Whenever you have thunderstorms, you can never truly represent the rainfall for thunderstorms because they're so localized. And typically what you want to do is when you see someone on TV and they, and they, they show you 0.5 or 0.75 and you're in between that, usually you can add those numbers up <laughs> and get the total of probably 1.25 because, you know, thunderstorms are so highly localized. And yesterday was a really good example of highly localized Rainfall. Yeah. Matter of exactly. fact, I think the people from Bartlett Trees would appreciate this. In, in the National Weather Service storm survey right up this morning, they showed a really large tree, probably about two feet in diameter, that got blown over on someone's car. Mm -hmm. And when the you one look in, at the tree. Um, Norwich? Um, I, I think it may have been Peg, but what's interesting, when you look at the picture of the tree, the inside of the tree, it's completely hollow. <laughs> So that tree was obviously diseased, and um, it's unfortunate because trees like that are, are known to be much more vulnerable uh, when you get into the latter half of summer when the leaves are fully bloomed out, and you get a 50-mile-an-hour wind, and that tree just comes right over, especially when the inside of the tree um, really doesn't exist at that point. I'm going to try to get that. Uh, you're talking about the recap of the July 24th gusty, gusty thunderstorms, that one? Is that right, the, but, but there was a there was a map from the uh, the Chicago land area that shows all the precip, and it really shows a nice track of where some of that rainfall was. Hmm. Um, but is that, but is that in the PDF you sent us this morning? Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, I, I I have to track it down, and I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get that up there. I'll but, see if uh, I can right. grab it. You know, somehow you can do it. Uh, but I want to uh, go out uh, west a little bit uh, because there's some. Uh, interesting stuff here. Hold on. Let me find this. Oh, yeah. This is uh, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, how the wildfire smoke is spreading across America. And, uh, you know, we've been seeing reports about New York City having the bright red sunsets and, you know, even uh, yeah. hard to breathe for some people uh, across the country. This is uh, just an amazing map here. Yeah. And, and, and one of the really interesting things here, Mike and Peg, is we now have um, forecast models, and if anybody wants to write it down, just write down the letters H, R, 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 
That's the high resolution rapid refresh. So type in HRRR and then the letters S-M-O-K-E for smoke. And what you'll get is an actual forecast of where the smoke is going to be, not only from a vertical standpoint of the atmosphere, but where it is all the way down to about two or 3,000 feet near the surface. And New York City actually had the worst air quality in over seven years near the surface because the way the, the air was, was not just moving from west to east, but was also compressing. So if you get smoke that's, um, you know, basically in a 15,000 foot column, all of a sudden compressed down to 3,000 feet, it clearly is a lot worse, especially in the afternoon when the sun is shining through it or in the morning when the sun is shining through it. If you look up, you're looking through a very thin layer of the atmosphere. If you're looking at it from a standpoint of horizontal, you're literally looking at it like, like this, where you're, you're seeing through a much longer uh, vantage point. So that's why it always appears to be red more so in the afternoon and the morning. It also has to do with the ultraviolet um, rays of the spectrum, which I won't get into now. But the bottom line is um, you can look at that site and then also airnow.gov, A-I-R-N-O-W dot, dot gov, and that will literally give you um, a, a tab where you can put in your zip code. And when you put in your zip code, it will get you the local or the most local air quality monitoring site from the EPA literally right in your neighborhood. And then you can click on that and you can see the trend of how it goes up or down through the course of the day. Um, I, the other day, we real were, quick, I just emailed you, Mike. Oh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. So when you when you look at airnow.gov and you click on it, you'll actually see a trend from like forty or fifty in the morning to like almost one hundred and twenty in the afternoon. And typically, one hundred is um, unhealthy, one fifty is moderate, and then two hundred is literally like unhealthful. Where meaning, if you have breathing problems, you shouldn't be outside. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now today. It's a little bit sunny, um, and it's. A, I'm actually looking at planes doing sky riding. I haven't seen that in a long time. Hmm. And they're actually spelling out Geico. That's unbelievable. <laughs> I'm, so I'm other than the sky. okay, and, and there's a <laughs> yeah, lizard on your shoulder, right? Yeah. Oh, there's your shoes. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's my shoes. I don't know. If you, yeah, you probably other can't than, see it. Other than uh, Rick, other than airnow.gov, what were the other sites? We had somebody asking. Yeah, um, H-R-R, -R, so H, three R's, and then the word smoke. And then that site will actually give you a forecast .com. of how the smoke is. Um, no, I think if you just Google it, Peg, it'll actually pull up the site. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll do a quick look at it as well, and that should actually, yeah. So if you do H-R-R smoke, and then you go to the GSL data visualization, um, that'll actually give you, there, there should be like two links there when you Google it. If you go to the second one with data visualization, that'll actually give you the forecast oh, yeah. model. Yep. Yeah. And you'll see it'll be vertically integrated and surface smoke. And you'll actually see uh, the way the smoke moves. So we're pretty good right now, but I wouldn't be surprised by this time tomorrow, you'll see the smoke from the California and bootleg Oregon fires, you know, migrate over us. And I don't and know if you guys got a chance to look at Look at those. Yeah. So this is this is Mount Moran on the 16th or the 18th of June. And then the next site or the next image is Mount Moran from yesterday. And you can't see it. That's just mm -hmm. amazing. So um, these these sites that I sent you, uh, this is obviously from the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. But if you go to the ones that are around the Susanville fire in California, you can actually go through that. Uh, the, the timeline by using that orange bowl at the bottom and slide back and forth and it, it, it's almost disheartening to do so because it's like looking at the destruction of, yeah, so that, that you see right there, that little um, puff in the middle of Northern California, that's the big fire that started up yesterday and that those three little white uh, dots to the northeast of that is the signature is the identifier for Susanville, but the next few images are actually the wildfires surrounding the, or the cameras surrounding that particular wildfire, and it, it's devastating to look at because 
you can actually see when you go back through the timeline um, the glow of, of the of the of the sky in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, clearly in the morning it's just kind of gray and black. But this is the same area that when you go through the maps have had literally ten percent of the of the rainfall over the last six months. And if you remember when President Trump went out there last year and they were pleading with him for some help, all he said was it'll get cooler. And he said science was wrong. Well, clearly science was right, Mr. President. It has not gotten cooler, and this is the third year of this. So I like to pose a question to your listeners. Are people now going to start changing the way they travel out west based on wildfires and based on smoke? We never had to think like that, but but now we are. I mean, it's mm-hmm. one thing to go – it's one thing to say I'm not going to Caribbean – in August because there's hurricanes, because we know that. That's what we call climate. But because the climate has become more variable, more changing, and now more violent, how is that affecting people's um, choices on when they travel out west? Well, and uh, now well, that's where they economic. I, yeah. well, I've I, been thinking of Grand Lakes, the Grand Lake Colorado fire a few years ago right at the base of Rocky Mountain National Park. Same thing. And, uh, yes, you know, yes. it, no one goes there anymore during the summertime. Yeah, I oh, I I've, I've been wanting to go to Yellowstone for several years. Now is not mm-hmm. the time uh, to really to go out there, is it? Although they're probably go getting the, million. Only winter time. Yeah, yeah, and not everything's all open the in the, in the winter time, but uh, that's I, it'd still be beautiful. By the way, um, uh, when when he was looking at the maps, Casey Tomato, our friend who lives in Kansas City, <laughs> just wrote, "I'm screwed." Uh, so uh, I, I, not out there. Yeah. So, uh, we're, we're about out of time. So, uh, I, and, uh, wait a second before we, we go, this is a, a day late and a dollar short, but, uh, Peggy sent me this, this is, this, is the stuff you were talking about for the, what happened in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those blue dots represent wind. So you can almost see the way the thunderstorm basically followed like the Kennedy expressway. And, um, mm-hmm. what would that be? Uh, Peterson, right. Route 14 there. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that was a thunderstorm that had pushed up to about forty eight thousand feet. Uh, there wasn't much hail with it, but man, did it rain hard! And the winds were generally between about, 50, about forty and about fifty mile an hour uh, gust. Uh, the one gust that's offshore there was about fifty four. Uh, but again, you know, it, it cleared the beaches, it cleared the sky, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we have some better visibility today. Uh, but the bottom line was. This was definitely a, a rainstorm that was needed for some areas. But again, the areas that needed it the most, as we've seen all summer, uh, did not get it. So as we, tr- as we kind of transition into the forecast, um, no rain today, no rain tomorrow, no rain Tuesday, no rain Wednesday, but definitely some big rains possible Wednesday night. And that's on, on the leading edge of the cool front. That could be a little bit more in the way of larger scale rains. And if people are saying to themselves, boy, this summer seems different where we don't get those nighttime thunderstorms developing, those nocturnal storms that kind of come through early in the morning. And the reason why is the way the ridge has pushed so far north and west, it's not able to latch on to the Gulf of Mexico moisture. So typically when Mm. you get these thunderstorms over like Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota, 9, 10 o'clock at night, they come through here in the morning. We're not getting that this year because the atmosphere has literally been nudged so far north that the jet stream north is not linking up to the jet stream south. Who's getting the big rains this year? New Mexico and Arizona. Go figure, right? Yeah. So, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, low, so low 90s today, but lower humidity. Low 90s tomorrow, higher humidity and then lower 90s for Tuesday and Wednesday, and then probably only in the um, upper 70s lakefront for Thursday and Friday, uh, and then lower 80s. But this will probably be the warmest four or five days since the second week of June. And you know what? Um, Today will be number, I think, 14 for days above 90, and I can live with that. (laughs) Okay. All right, Rick, thanks. Uh, I hope your back gets better. Um, Don't... Don't don't go swimming too much, or maybe that will fix it. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, all right, you have you have a great week, and uh, we'll talk to you next Sunday. 
Sounds good. Bye, Mike. Bye, Pig. Uh, and before we go, uh, very quickly, uh, we, uh, we had one of our commenters online remind folks that, uh, yeah, they should go fill out our survey. Uh, we sent out a newsletter this week uh, that uh, uh, a lot of folks got. We've we've posted it on social media. It's on the website, mm-hmm. MikeNovak.net, right at the, the top of the page. Um, we need your help in figuring out, uh, you know, where where we go from here. And uh, uh, we just want to know if we're doing the right thing and uh, you enjoy what you're seeing, how we can make it better. And that that's mm-hmm. the whole point. So uh, we want to get as many comments as we possibly can. Um, and we, Peggy, give us a, a shout out for uh, Sega as well. Chicago Excellence in Gardening Awards continues for the month of August, so you still have plenty of time for your sixty second video challenge. Get out in the garden with your phone, take some photos, take some video, put some um, copyright free music behind it. Sixty seconds, no free popcorn, Deb. Sorry, and uh, post it to ChicagoGardeningAwards.org. All right, there we go. Uh, Ernest says, New York has worse air quality from the fires than we do in Portland. Mm-hmm, exactly. Um, let's get out of here. I want to thank everybody who was on the show today. Boy, what a, a great conversation, a couple of great conversations we had uh, with Molly Gleason and uh, uh, Bob Benenson uh, talking about local food. want to thank Edith Macra and uh, Mayor Kevin Burns from Geneva for their conversation about climate change and municipalities. Uh, thanks to Rick DeMaio. Thanks to Legata the Cat, who did a cameo. Thanks to Basil. Yay. We need a Basil cameo at some point. Uh, thanks and to everybody. Jack, Jack, Jax the dog also appeared. That's right. So until next time, go green or go home. Uh, uh, what? Is that it? Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much.